Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Honest Discussions. I'm your host, Dr. Randon Patterson, and today we're going to talk to Lisa Doggett, who is the author of her new book, Up the Down Escalator. I had an incredibly pleasurable conversation with her. She is a doctor, she is a mother, and she is a fighter living with multiple sclerosis. Her book really brings out the dark underbelly of the U.S. healthcare system. It's all contained within this incredible story uh, about her family life and her professional life. I really enjoyed reading the book. I encourage you to check it out. It's on Amazon, and uh, I hope you enjoy our discussion today. We cover uh, a lot of topics, in particular how people that live in poverty suffer under the U.S. healthcare system the way it is built, and without substantial change, there is no end in sight for improving the system beyond what it is today. I encourage everybody to please like, share, subscribe these videos. Uh, we're trying to do something that hopefully will have an impact on how the world sees our doctors, our scientists, and hopefully build a big enough platform that we can aid in funding these endeavors which are continually being defunded. If you think the police are being defunded, you should check out science. It's way, way worse. So uh, on that note, enjoy the show. Medical training is really, really tough. Um, residency, probably even more so. Um, I, I think that things have gotten better over the last 20 years since I graduated from medical school and residency, but we still have a long way to go. And unfortunately, I think it just is, it's exhausting and demoralizing and uh, and it's not healthy. Um, you know, asking people to stay up for you know, two, you know, day and a half at a time. Uh, now I think the, the hours are more limited, but it still really, really does a number on your personal life and, and you can't take care of yourself the way you need to uh, when you're in that kind of training environment. Yeah. And, and it, I mean, it does need some type of reform. I mean, yeah, for the, and the biggest reform being the elimination or in, severe decrease in them in the cost because Part of what's driving all of this is that medical students get out of school with so much debt that they are handcuffed to the uh, working in a, uh, an office that sees insured patients so that the insurance is safe money, so to speak, albeit right, right. Uh, uh, so that they can do these 15 minute. Uh, interviews with people and somehow that's supposed to be enough for every single visit, which is not true. I mean, the biggest thing that I love that you put forward is it is not okay to just shuffle people through the system. And unfortunately, when you're a first year practicing doctor with thousands of dollars a month to pay in student loan debt. What choice do you have other than to try and hit these quotas that are thrown at you from essentially insurance companies and directors of your institute that require X amount of cash flow, and that's the real measure of success, not what was patient outcome, not what how do patients feel about the experience they had i mean mind blowing yeah we still definitely are too reliant on this fee for service model in our healthcare system where doctors are paid for the number of patients they see uh, rather than the value of care they provide and i think there's a you know there's a a movement to get us more towards the value side where uh you know that is value that is uh, rewarded uh you know when good care is provided but 
uh, we have a very long way to go. And it's tricky to know kind of what the right answers are. I don't think there is an easy answer uh, for payment reform. Um, lots of patients need to be seen and there aren't enough doctors. I think one of the other issues with what you're talking about coming out of medical school with a lot of debt is it really also forces students to go into a specialty and subspecialize. And we end up with not enough primary care doctors because the specialists uh, are paid substantially more than primary care for sure. But if you didn't have this severe debt coming out of school, I believe many more people like yourself would be more interested in going into primary care. More people would, although it, primary care is is really tough and it's exhausting and we don't have the support we need. I mean, I, and as I wrote about in the book, we had a clinic system of over 20 clinics and I don't think we had a single social worker and we were dealing with the most vulnerable, low-income patients in our community um, and we didn't have support. I mean, I was the default social worker and yet I'm still trying to see patients as quickly as possible. And then having to do the social work part after hours and uh, not really knowing necessarily who to call or what to do. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's a part of the reason also that people don't go into primary care and as much as we need them to, um, because the expectations are really um, extraordinary and often forcing them to practice, you know, to practice beyond their scope of care and also push them into doing jobs that they normally wouldn't have to do as a doctor. I, but if we look back, I mean, I'm old enough to remember having a doctor come to my home. I'm old enough to remember that. And those doctors with way less information than people had today did their very best and everybody thanked them for it. You know, if, if, mm -hmm. And you bring that back to the training. It's like training reform, I would think, and I'd be curious to get your opinion, mm -hmm. uh, should should be, you know, are we, should we be specializing, quote unquote, specializing even earlier that people that are going in one tract take one set of intro curriculum courses versus the general practitioner and then Perhaps, you know, we can design teaching environments where the general practitioners actually get what they need out of school. And then yeah. on top of that, you know, start bringing up these ideas of, well, do we do just like they are suggesting police officers need social workers in their environment? Is this something that doctors also need, especially young doctors? trying to enter into general practice where they are going to be confronted with these types of issues on a daily basis. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that we really need to be have, we need to focus on having an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary team, especially in community clinics where, uh, you know, see a lot of patients without private insurance. Um, those patients we know are facing a lot of things beyond you know, the medications they're taking and the clinical conditions they have, they're dealing with a lot of what we're now calling social determinants of health that impact their health far more than anything we can do in a clinic setting. Um, studies show that, you know, the, the environment in which people live, work and play, go to school is uh, accounts for 80 to 90% of their health outcomes compared to just 10 to 20% that we can provide in the clinic. And so having that extra support beyond what the doctor can do is really important. And that includes, you know, nurses, behavioral health counselors, which, you know, often psychologists, um, as well as social work and therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, I mean, dental care, there's a real range of um, special, you know, other types of health prayer, health professional special, specialists that um, we need to pull into a clinic setting that is, is requiring it because of the needs of the patient population. Not all clinic settings need that. If you have a, a really high income population and well-educated, uh, you, you might not need all of those extra supports, but in a clinic like where I worked, um, those were essential and we really didn't have them. Well, maybe we should start there. What, what inspired you, first of all, uh, to go into general practice and work with 
uh, the most difficult population in America, which is our impoverished people and uh, migrants as well, being a large part of that. Right. And right. then how does that lead to you writing this incredible book? Well, thank you. Um, you know, I grew up in a family where public service was a way of life. So my dad was in uh, politics as a state senator. Uh, he was elected 11 days after I was born at the uh, age of 26, uh, served in the Texas legislature. Uh, and, and his whole mission was really like trying to help give a voice to people who normally wouldn't have that voice because they didn't have the income or the education to speak out for themselves. And uh, so I really have followed in his footsteps, although in, I'll be in a very different path with medicine um, in, in choosing to do to work in a, in a clinic for people that are, are low income. Um, I really, my mom as well is an advocate for, and has been a national advocate for early childhood families and young children. Um, she actually works in the Obama administration leading their early childhood initiatives. Um, and so again, like this was, <laughs> this was a mission for me to find a pathway that where I could make a difference and family medicine really made the most sense. I thought, you know, this is a way for me to work with people of all ages, um, from, from all over the place with any kind of medical problem. I at least can be, you know, the, the person that can hopefully see them and connect them with any specialists that they need to see. Um, so I, I think that I went to medical school in order to work at a place like the clinic I describe in the book, which is helping, helping again, the most vulnerable population, most vulnerable people in my community. And so how, one of the things you describe in the book is the, the emotional turmoil that occurs when you're trying to help these people without the resources. And I was, I mean, I knew that things like that happen, but when you, the way you describe it, it's, it's, it's shocking. I mean, I get upset that my doctor does have a timer in his office. And when he comes in, he clicks the button. And when the button goes off, you're even if you're not done, you're done. And well, and that's kind of smart. <laughs> in fact, I probably should have done that sometimes because you know, the trade-off is if if he doesn't do that, then other people are going to be waiting. And I was running late almost every day, sometimes an hour or more late regularly. And it was awful. It was awful for me. It was awful for the patients. But I felt like if I didn't do, you know, give the patients what they needed and really make sure I was doing, you know, checking the boxes and not just on the electronic medical record, but actually going through and asking the right questions that I was going to miss something like my MS would have been missed had I been one of those patients. Um, and I really think that it, it's a it's a difficult situation when you're caring for people with people. Uh, one of my colleagues put it best. He said, people are inefficient with inefficient problems. And so the system, when you're forced to go, you know, stick with this schedule and it's very rigid, um, that can make things really tough. I think we need to have more flexible schedules. And again, we need to have that interdisciplinary team with lots of different uh, other types of health professionals to support primary care um, doctors as we're seeing patients. But how do we even start to get to that place? Where, where, is, the, where is the beginning of that road where uh, a, a, either a family practice or a clinic like you're running is not just the physician, it is the mental health person, it is these other positions that, you know, guess what? You might be able to go in and recognize very quickly, oh, this is something, this person has some type of psychiatric issue. And yeah. boom, within five minutes, you can be moving them to the person that can actually help them at a much deeper level. How do we right, even right. begin to get to that place? It's tough and I don't have all the answers. I, I think we definitely need some kind of payment reform that again, values value over uh, numbers. Um, we pay specialists far more than we pay primary care doctors. The thinking part of medicine is not valued the way procedures are. I'm not saying the specialists should be paid less, but I think that we need to reform our system so that primary care doctors are paid fairly and that we are given the time with patients to be able to, to give them what they need, especially when they're in a vulnerable situation. Um, you know, I had patients who 
had bats in their apartment, who had um, employers that were really unfair to them and not paying them for their work or not giving them breaks, even though they had um, medical conditions that required it. Um, those kinds of situations required me to, you know, either ignore them or better to write a letter to support them and then follow up to make sure that they got the help they needed. But that takes time and, and that takes extra support that I didn't have. And so that's why I struggled so much uh, working longer hours and um, really feel, felt like I was regularly um, you know, just off balance in terms of work life and, and, and my family at home. I, I just couldn't be everything to everyone. Clearly, I mean, most people that are in the, these types of disciplines, I mean, all kind of suffer the same types of things, but yours are clearly much more personal because you're dealing with people, not just a pile of papers or, you know, a bunch of emails or, you know, that still can keep people away from their family and whatnot, but it's a very different, very different context. Uh, sure. Yeah. So how, how do we talk about reforming the pay scales? Because if medical school didn't cost so much, certainly pay, certain pay scales could be adjusted. But uh, at the same time, how do we adjust things so that everybody's getting what they deserve? Because clearly somebody who's a neuroscientist that put, and does brain surgery and did 12 years of residency to be able to do certain procedures that they, without all of that time, they would have never been able to do. Clearly that is worth something. For sure. Absolutely. No, I think we really need to look to other countries for ideas. There are models all over the world that are working so much better than ours. So we are the only industrialized nation that doesn't have universal access to healthcare. We have, we are also spending far more per capita than anywhere else in the world on healthcare and our outcomes are worse. So it'd be different if we were doing all of this and getting better outcomes, but actually we have very high rates of infant mortality, maternal mortality, our life expectancy is lower than most industrialized nations because we are not doing this the right way. So we are leaving out lots and lots of people and we're not getting the outcomes we need. We need to look to other countries for models. And I don't really know enough about you know, who's getting it right. Although I know that a lot of other countries are doing better than we are. <laughs> I'll never forget when I was in Amsterdam, I got a, an abscess, a tooth abscess and it was in horrible pain. And, but I had Dutch friends and I was talking to them and they're like, Oh, we'll just call our dentist. And it was a Saturday. They don't work on Saturdays, but no, it was a phone call. We went to the dentist's office at 10 AM he comes in, he uh, gives me antibiotics, gives me a painkiller, and, uh, you know, it's like you can't fly until Tuesday or Wednesday at the earliest, but, and it was taken care of. So I pull out my wallet, and my Dutch friend immediately slaps it out of my hand, and the doctor was looking at me strange, and he's like, we don't do that here. And wow. yeah. I was just like blown away, 27 year old man, you know, that the dentist for an American, not even part of the country doesn't pay taxes. No, it was an insult to try and pay the dentist. Wow. They have a lot of different, <laughs> different models of care uh, in Europe, certainly, and, and around the world. Um, and, and we need to look to those other countries and, and figure out what's working and try to make some of those changes here. Of course, politically, a lot of that's untenable. And we just, I think, first well, and foremost, we need... Lose... Oh, I'm sorry. Go just ahead. Yeah. Oh, people no, go ahead. Keep, people would keep losing, people would start losing money. That's all that would be about. It's it's not a priority here. And that's what's so unfortunate. I mean, I, I think we pride ourselves on having the best healthcare system and, and yet it's not the best healthcare system. We're leaving out so many people. It is if you're in, in the 1%. If you're in the 1%, this right. is the best healthcare system in the world. And if you're not part of the sure. 1% and you're in the bottom 50%, it as you, the numbers show, it's one of the worst actually for industrialized nations. Do you yeah. think that, are 
complete lack of preventative care in this country is a major source of all of these health outcomes? We don't have enough preventive care. I don't think we have a complete lack of it. Um, I do, you know, that was a big priority for me as a family doctor was trying to ensure that people had preventive care. That's a, that I have a new position I'm starting in the fall where that will be another, uh, that will be a big focus too. Um, you know, but we don't do enough. Um, the Affordable Care Act helped. We took away the premiums for people having to pay for a mammogram. And I had a patient actually before the Affordable Care Act who wouldn't get her mammogram because she couldn't afford the, pers- the uh, I think it was like 20% that she had to pay on top of, you know, Medicare. She had Medicare. Um, she had to pay the extra uh, portion of the cost and she couldn't afford it. It wasn't a, even a choice. She truly couldn't afford it. Um, and so people for would forego preventive care like that patient because of uh, the cost for preventive care. And, and fortunately, we have now prioritized preventive care, and that is that is covered by insurance, that that extra deductible. Um, but we still have a very long way to go. And it's it's unfortunate how many people still are not getting their screening for cancer that they need to, are not getting immunizations. Immunizations are a huge part, part of preventive care. And yet, you know, we have large portions of the population that refuse to get vaccinated, don't believe in vaccines. Um, and, and it's uh, a real s- sad thing to see people that get in, get seriously ill and even die as a result. Um, but we have a long way to go with uh, prioritizing preventive care to the extent that it needs to be done. Well, and this is the part that if you want to see what we're talking about, you'll have to go watch the episode on Rumble, where scientists and physicians are not censored about the work that they work on. Uh, YouTube is a great platform because it has a huge audience, but the censorship on this platform has really gotten out of control because you can't even talk about or or the biology of even though I'm a virologist and a molecular biologist, I'm not allowed to talk about it. Can't talk about the history of man. You can't talk about how is mathematically manipulating the public. You can't talk. And uh, that's why I really encourage everyone to please check us out on Rumble. Subscribe there. That's where you're going to hear the real dope. So... Uh, on that note, on with the show. Uh, and so many other things to talk about. Like, uh, when, when you discussed in the book about uh, people getting the care they need who were not citizens, I think that everybody needs to hear your experience because, yes, we should have some type of controlled immigration. I don't think mo- many people think it should just be uncontrolled, that we should be able to decide who comes into the country and who doesn't. But once you're here and you have a problem, I mean, we have to be a human being first. I agree. And, and I would just love for people to hear your experience with that community and how any ideas that you have to try and deal with it moving forward. I agree. I think it's the compassionate thing as well as frankly, the economical thing to do to take care of people once they're here um, and and provide healthcare that they need and deserve. Um, We have a lot of people who are immigrants, um, legal or not, they're providing a great deal of support for our workforce. Um, Many of them are taking jobs that others wouldn't want and don't want. Um, often are paid low wages, um, and they deserve to have care just like everybody else. Um, it's, it's really tricky, but I've certainly had a lot of patients who have, uh, struggled because they, they were allowed to come to my clinic, but getting care for them was much more difficult because they didn't qualify for patient assistance programs to get free medications. Like many of our other low income patients, um, they couldn't see specialists without having to pay more. Um, there were certain things like if they needed dialysis, they couldn't get it unless they were having an absolute emergency. Um, and, and to the point where they were on death's door, then they could get dialysis, but being able to do it in a, in a, you know, 
earlier stage where it would actually prevent them from getting so sick was not allowed. Um, I had a patient one time who had um, some kind of major issue in her spinal cord. She was a young mother um, who had three children and uh, including a new baby. And she was basically dismissed from three or four emergency rooms uh, before coming to see me. I noticed she had some neurologic findings and was able to get an MRI at a discount urgently because it was an emergency. Um, she ended up having spinal cancer. Um, and we admitted her to the hospital. She was then discharged from the hospital because they told her she had to pay $10,000 up front in order to get any kind of surgery. Um, I mean, it was, it was just a horrible challenge to try to get her care. Ultimately she did at a medical school in a different city, but it is heartbreaking to have p patients who are here that are working hard and are not able to get just basic care or emergency care. Um, as they, as they should, just because they're an, another human being. And, you know, part of that too, is they're here and working hard, as you said, and their employers uh, are just like, well, if you don't keep up, there's somebody right behind you. And you can, you know, we, we don't care if you exist or not, even though we're living off of your back and not paying taxes on your labor and, 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 but. Right. 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 So, Maybe you could explain, because I, I think this is something that people think is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's a myth. They think it's a myth that people without insurance, whether migrant or not, people without insurance or very poor insurance end up paying way more than people that do. Why is that? What's the reasoning behind it? How can uh, how can hospitals get away with this type of stuff? Yeah, so I think what you're referring to is uh, is that individuals who are uninsured will have to pay kind of the full rate um, for care. Um, whereas insurance companies are able to negotiate a discounted rate because they have large numbers of patients. So um, it, it is, there was a Wall Street Journal article from a few years ago that looked at the costs that were billed to an individual who was uninsured versus what an insurance company would pay. And it's substantially different. So if you are uninsured and you have to go for an x-ray or you have to go in for a hospitalization or an emergency room procedure, um, often you will get a larger bill than the insurance company would. Um, there are sometimes programs where you can get charity care, where there's discounts. Our clinic had a program where you could get discounted radiology um, that was substantially less than, um, than full price. Um, but without those kinds of programs, you're often going to pay a lot more because you don't have that um, power to go in like an insurance company with thousands of patients to negotiate a lower rate. It's well, really unfair. I was going to say, how is that fair? How is that? even it's allowed not. that was part of the, your book that just made me so <laughs> angry i could spit nails like how is this yeah. possible yeah yeah no it was really unfortunate and i mean it, it, again if i spent extra time trying to advocate for my patients as i did i could sometimes get that reversed or get some kind of extra charity care for them um, but it took a lot of extra work in order to make that happen and a lot of my patients would just be stuck with these bills that were they were paying indefinitely because they could never actually pay them off. Right. And then you end up with people in bankruptcy and then right. it's a vicious cycle. Worse. And it's exactly right. because now they have the stress, stress deteriorates any and all medical conditions. There's right. no, there's no, uh, it's true. there's no disease that is immune to stress. Sure. Sure. And yeah. Yeah. And all you're doing is, creating this vicious cycle that it will get worse and worse. Right. Yeah, exactly. I, I had a, a really hard, uh, a hard time swallowing that pill. I don't know how it even could be legal. Like you can do it with a hotel room because of demand. You know, you right. can change the price of the hotel room and that makes sense to people. Right. It doesn't make sense to me that somebody absolutely requires like dialysis before they die and that, no, we're going to charge you 
if you end up in the emergency room, we're only going to do it if we have to, and then it's going to cost you three times what it would cost to do the average for the same exact procedure. Right. Exactly. No, I, I think that that is a, a huge problem. I, I think a lot of people are unaware of it. I was unaware of it as a doctor uh, until I had patients who were getting charged these ridiculously high bills for radiology procedures. And I started looking into it and was like, wait a second, they're, they're charging my uninsured patients far more than they would uh, charge an insurance company. And it's because they are uninsured and can't negotiate. Um, grossly unfair and uh it, it was even at the community hospital, you know, our public hospital that this was happening. I don't know if it's still happening, um, but it wouldn't be surprised. And, and apparently it's a pretty re regular practice around the country. So yes, yeah, I, if you're uninsured, you will often pay more. I mean, I've seen on some of my own bills, hundred dollars for ibuprofen of which I've always, you know, called and been like, you know, this is no. <laughs> not happening. Yeah. But if you don't read the bill, you know, right. there it is. Right. Uh, no, it's great that you're looking. I think that's one of my uh, bits of advice for people is really to look carefully at your bills, advocate for yourself. Don't be afraid to speak up. You've got to make those extra phone calls, but it's worth doing because you often can save a lot of money that way. For people that don't know, you actually can ne negotiate your, for yourself with the hospital. And uh, I've done it once in my youth and no you actually you actually can you can agree and yes and actually if you have a bill that you truly can't pay it's important to call the hospital don't ignore it call the hospital explain your situation and they often will give you a discount and work out a payment plan but again you have to ask for it it's there's there's a, not a lot of hard and fast rules a lot of things are flexible but again you have to advocate for yourself i think that's really important here's something agree. else i want to ask you because you yeah. brought up about the uh, all of the paperwork that is done and the paperwork issues and the systems that you're required to use to do these things. How much of the cost of healthcare in America, how much is it inflated by all of these, some of them completely nonsensical rules, like you couldn't have... Uh, alcohol tissue wipes in a, 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 in a room yeah. unless they were locked like yeah how much how much of this is creating additional costs due to labor and then also it also seems like waste is involved Sure. No, it's got to be a lot. I haven't seen numbers um, as to how much additional cost uh, some of these inane rules uh, cause but uh, it's, it's, it's definitely ridiculous and, and it really varies, I think, place to place. I, I think that some clinics are able to get by without having to, uh, I mean, some of it's just kind of the interpretation even of the rules. I don't know that the rules themselves were that ridiculous, but the administrator's interpretation, uh, often made it pretty tricky for us to operate, um, at, you know, our, our, as our best capacity at our best capacity and, and with maximal efficiency, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's got to add a lot, but I, I don't know the numbers. Well, it's even if it's 10 or 20 percent, that would be in America. Oh, a lot. That'd be a yeah, ton. like yeah. many hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think that I'm hoping that part of this podcast, what it's about is having these types of honest discussions where uh, I don't come into it with there's any right or wrong answers. It's about putting the information out there and really just letting people decide for themselves, you know, because sure. yeah. if you, it's okay to play devil's advocate. It's okay to uh, look at things through different lenses. And maybe once somebody hears both sides, maybe their answer will be somewhere in the middle, most likely. So, yeah. uh, I'm hoping that by you getting your words out, that it will counteract some of what people see in the TV every day, telling them that they need this and they need that, and we have to do it this way. And it's like, no, we actually, what we need is some type of reform to start where 
you know, they've been talking about single payer health care for God knows how long. It doesn't yeah, seem seconds. like the American government will ever bow to that because of uh, the dangerous socialism that it creates. Uh, <laughs> but we need some type of reform because having you spend, I don't know how much of your day it is, but having you doing reports that are meaningless versus the stuff that you need to be writing down on the patient's history and the stuff you need to be writing down to make sure that the patient gets the treatment they need. And then on top of that, making it that the medical information system works. I, right, right. I, I mean, I want you to talk <laughs> about it and I'm sure everybody's had their own experiences, but I mean, it's taken me at one point when I was get, trying to just get a knee MRI moved from a, a hospital to a surgeon took over a week and yeah. hours and hours of phone calls. And then finally right, having to right. go too to much, the hospital, get the MRI and take it to the, ultimately take it to the surgeon. Wow. Yeah. I mean, not surprising at all, actually, unfortunate, uh, but yeah, not surprising. Uh, I think, you know, as patients, we have to realize that our system is not set up well. We need to have a good doctor, uh, someone that we can trust, that we can really partner with to make sure that we have support when we're facing challenges like this. We do have to have insurance. I recommend everybody have insurance if they possibly can. And of course, that's not an option for everybody, but there are people that opt out of it. Um, and you never know what's going to happen. Like with me at age 36, I got multiple sclerosis and I was, you know, the most healthy person on paper that you would ever, I, mean, I was doing everything I could think of to be healthy and, and totally got, got MS out of the blue and multiple sclerosis is a disease of the central nervous system that can cause a variety of problems, including progression to, um, serious mobility problems and disability. So having insurance was key. I, the, my medication cost. Uh, the same as about a mid-range used car is the way I describe it for a three-month supply. Um, and that's unfortunately the case with um, some of the other kind of chronic autoimmune diseases. But uh, our system is not friendly. It's not set up to be helpful to people in many cases. We do need to, to you know, do our best as individuals to make sure we we stay healthy, um, do the do all the right things you can to stay healthy, um, have insurance, have a good doctor. And then when you're in a situation that's where you're facing, you know, a health problem, you have to advocate for yourself. Well, the prices for these drugs is just ludicrous. And as no, a, a retired true. academic researcher, uh, I want to explain to people how it, how the system actually really works most of the time. Most yeah. of the time, the drug is developed in an academic institution where a scientist that's been paid by the NIH or the NSF or some government agency for the most part develops this technology. Then a drug company comes along and is like, oh, well, this looks promising. We're going to license this from you where you've already done most of the work. And then they get it from the university and then they do some work on it and they claim this work costs in excess of a hundred X what it actually, the university right. spent on it. And they use these justifications to say, well, we've spent all of this money on the drug. No, you didn't. What you did is you ran a human based study now, those are expensive. Yeah. However, you're a drug company. You are making billions of dollars. So you should be able to afford it. And no, now they're even trying to push that back on to the universities. That, oh, well, we won't sign a licensing agreement with you for XYZ pharmacology until you've done phase one trials. The university. Well, wow. they don't have the money either. So what, what we have, and then the drug comes out and then they charge a small car price tag <laughs> right, for exactly. three months supply. And this is for yeah. cancer patients. This is for anyone with an autoimmune disease. This is 
I mean, you could go up and down the ladder of chronic diseases or awful diseases, and this is just commonplace. And meanwhile, many of these drugs maybe shouldn't even be on the market. It's hard to know. Some of them are not studied well enough. That's for sure. Exactly. But what do we do? We put one of the people that worked for us in our company, we put them in the FDA for a few years until the drugs in our pipeline get approved by that FDA person. And then we bring them back in the fold and rehire them and pay them uh, multi-million dollar bonuses at the end of every year. It's hard to trust the system, but uh, you know, I think that we have a lot to learn and a lot that we can learn from, from other countries. And um, there are a lot of good ideas out there. We just need to prioritize um, making healthcare affordable for everyone and making sure everybody has access. Well, Maybe this is a good transition into the other part of your book, which... And I have to warn you, I have a three o'clock, or like a phone call at the top of the hour. I'm just realizing I didn't oh, say that. So oh, okay. So I've got another 10 minutes, but like, I don't have a lot more than, a lot of more time than that. Well, then let's spend the last 10 minutes on mul multiple sclerosis because... Okay. Uh, as I said to you when we started this out, you know your courage in putting out your story in the personal level that you do it, first of all, is what makes the book so easy to read and captivating because it really does. Thank you. Thank you. I burned through it in two days, didn't put it down. It was easy, easy read, but yeah. super pleasurable. Like you're a good writer. Thank uh, you. So when you, why don't you just give people a little bit of background on, MS and how it affected you and, you know, what anybody should really actually be looking for, because the, the road to diagnosing MS, uh, I think the clearest thing you can say is that you could actually go years with it before you know that you have it. And that may be uh, a lot of damage occurring before you're even you're right. recognizing of it. No, you're absolutely right. So um, I was directing a clinic for people without insurance um, and then woke up dizzy one day myself, uh, never expecting to be the patient. Um, and I was super fortunate because uh, I got help very fast. Um, my dizziness, I thought at first was just like a cold. I didn't go away. Um, later in the week, I saw a neurologist friend over lunch. I saw an ENT doctor, ear, nose and throat doctor, the following Monday, got an MRI the following Tuesday. Within eight days or nine days of symptom onset, I had a diagnosis of MS. As you said, uh, it's a really tricky disease to diagnose because the presentation is so different. So I had dizziness and double vision. Visual changes are fairly common with MS, but people can have mobility problems, um, just cognitive problems, just not able to think clearly. Numbness and tingling is another one where people will get kind of it's a common presentation with MS. Temperature but, issues. Yeah, but the, the reality is there's not a single presentation that tips you off that this is MS. Um, and the MRI test is usually uh, how we diagnose it along with symptoms as well as sometimes, as in my case, uh, a spinal tap uh, to look for certain types of proteins that we see with MS. Um, you know, I think that anybody that has unusual neurologic symptoms, especially if they're a woman and they're younger, so between ages 20 and 50 is when MS is most commonly diagnosed. Um, women are about three to one more likely to get MS compared to men. Um, so those are patients where you, you know, it's important to to look as the doctor, uh, just consider things like MS. Um, and if you're the patient, you have to sometimes, again, really advocate for yourself to get an answer if you're not getting a clear diagnosis. Not any, but many uh, diseases of the immune system, one of which I consider allergies to be a disease of the immune system since I suffer from them. But yeah, pretty much any and all symptoms that you could think of can be a symptom when you start involving the immune system. It could feel like arthritis. Yeah. It could feel like uh, cramping. It could feel like like you said, that you just have a brain fog. These are yeah. all things mm -hmm. that could be uh, a symptom of an immune disorder, in particular MS. And uh, 
just to explain to people a little bit that MS occurs when the myelin sheaths around the neurons get degraded. Mm -hmm. And when the myelin sheaths degrade, what that does is it causes an electrical leak through the neurons that then they start behaving abnormally, which is why then you can get all kind of any and all uh, symptoms. There's just, yeah, a huge variety of symptoms. I mean, I think the good thing about MS is that about 85% of people have relapsing, remitting forms of it, which is what I have. So you actually do get better. However, that contributes as well to the tricky diagnosis because a lot of people will have symptoms that maybe last a few days, maybe even a few weeks, um, but usually it will get better on its own because that's the remitting of the original, you know, the, the flare that you're having with MS. And, uh, and so people may stop looking for a diagnosis because they're getting better. Um, then they'll have something else pop up years later or, you know, months later uh, in many cases. And unfortunately there's damage happening on, you know, underlying all of that. Um, we know that disease modifying medications like the one that I'm taking um, dramatically reduce the progression to disability. Um, those medicines are really, really important, but if you don't get diagnosed early on, you can miss a huge opportunity to start medication and reduce your chances of, of getting worse. So prevention is the key. Prevention is really important. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. I don't want you to miss your call. I really appreciate you taking this moment to talk about this. Are you going to be putting out a new book? Do you have a new book in the works? Oh, I don't have a new book in the works right now. I'm just working on getting this one out to the world. But uh, Up the Down Escalator, uh, Medicine, Motherhood, and Multiple Sclerosis, that is my memoir, just released in August and uh, really hoping to get a lot of attention and that it helps people um, with chronic disease, those who take care of people with chronic disease, or just anyone going through a challenge. Um, I hope that it can be helpful and, and uh, resonate with, with those people. Well, I can say that it's inspiring and it hits uh, many heartstrings and uh, I, I appreciated reading it and I thank you again. And I really do hope to speak to you again on uh, when you actually have a little more time. <laughs> <laughs> sure. No problem. I, I didn't know, expect I to have a call get scheduled at three, but I uh, had a colleague who uh, had RSVP to a meeting that had fallen off my calendar. And, and so I'm going to try to grab grab the call with her, but no yeah, worries. I really long... enjoyed it. Me too. Thank you so much. You're and, welcome. You asked really probing, thought-provoking questions. Well, here's hoping that uh, you end up on the New York Times bestseller list. I'm hoping for you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>